on bringing remote sensing data into impact evaluations. Um, I'm Esther Forgan. I am in the evaluation unit and lead the SEDL program, which has organised this session um, jointly with the FCDO Data Hub. Um, today we're going to have an excellent presentation, an excellent training session rather, um, organised through the FCDO's Centre for Excellence for Development, Impact and Learning, which innovates on impact evaluations and evidence synthesis. Um, we're going to have a session on the some of the real practicalities of remote sensing, a, a practical session using the code to get you a bit more of a nitty gritty feel of what it will do. Um, to note, as in the one on Monday, we'll be recording the event and the recording will, of the event will be available externally. So um, to let you know by speaking, you are giving consent for this to be shared. Um, today's session will be led by Ayush uh, Malik from um, 3IE, um, who is uh, a specialist in data science there. Um, he will introduce, you know, the practicalities of how he's doing it, but this is a very hands on session so that, you know, please do come in with questions um, if you're stuck. At the end of the meeting, um, Tim Harris will, from the FCDO Data Hub will close the session. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Ayush for an interesting session. Thank you, Esther, for such such a good introduction, and uh, I'm I'm really excited to present the today's session because it's more hands-on, it's more code code coding driven, and um, so I do hope that the uh, that the participants who are who are there today uh, can should should have probably attended the first session that we had day before yesterday, where we covered the practical uh, more more. Uh, the general overview of how remote sensing and satellite imagery could be used for impact evaluation and uh, what the benefits are, what the challenges are, how to look into those things. Uh, and then this session is more focused on doing the actual work, like after, after having the introduction, how do you actually do those things? So this is how we shall be doing that. And uh, some Points before we begin, you must have got an email from Jane from 3IE and from Jenna um, from Saddle about some Saddle or FCDO. I'm, I'm sorry, Jenna. So you must have got an email about uh, this tutorial, which she has also pasted in the chat box. And then you were also asked to make a Google Earth Engine account before the session. Those two things are important. This, uh, the, the tutorial will allow you to run the codes on your own system. For that, you need a uh, account with Google. A normal Gmail account can work, and then you also had to have an account with Google Earth Engine. It is important to have the account with Google Earth Engine because if you do not have that, you will not be able to authenticate yourself while we run the code, and without authentic without authentication, you will not be able to run the whole thing uh, on on your own as well. The other thing is that the whole tutorial is very hands on. It means that for any reason that you are not able to follow what's being done over here right now, and if you do not have a Google Earth Engine account, which could happen that you do, you may not have, you could still go through the tutorial yourself. And then, okay, somebody was not able to create a Google Earth Engine account. Okay, then it's perfectly fine. You could see what we are doing today, and then when you are when you are able to create a Google Earth Engine account, you can go through the entire thing yourself. And if you have any questions or if you find any roadblocks, you can always reach out to me via my email address and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that uh, you may have. So those are the few things that I wanted to cover before we begin. Um, so and also one more thing that the methodology that we are taking over here in this notebook, so we call this as a notebook, is one of the several ways to accomplish something. According to you, it may not be the best way or it is not the only way to accomplish that task. There are many ways of reaching the same destination. We chose the one that we cover in this notebook. However, that's not exhaustive and there are other ways to do that as well. So with that, I will begin. I had originally divided the whole tutorial into four modules. The first one, which we had already covered day before yesterday. So today I shall not be covering uh, that part. Today I will be moving to this one, module two, which is introduction to technology stack, and then module three, introduction to vegetation and water indices, and then hands-on demo. Uh, yes, yes, Esther, it'll, it'll be uh, valuable in that case. So 
uh, but uh, I would also like to cover tutorial use cases. So why did we why did we create the uh, actual tutorial? So there were there were some purposes that we had in mind. One of them is we wanted you to know about the fundamentals of remote sensing, their applications and important considerations which we had covered earlier. Second is you, we wanted you to know how actually you could download the satellite data because that was one thing when I started learning about satellite imagery that was not very clear to me. So it was a, it was a learning for me uh, for for my own uh, self as well. So how you could download them, then how you could calculate indices. There are various ways of calculating indices. You could either do that in Google Earth Engine or you could use a um, um, geospatial software as well. That's possible. Then we talk about uh, enhanced vegetation index, M, N, D, W, I, N, D, V, I, those sort of indices in detail in the tutorial. For, 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 for the session, I will be going through the actual code. The other technicalities that are related to why we should use one index and not the other, and for what variable should we use that to, to measure, when not to use that, how to use that, what are the things that one should keep in mind. We will not be covering those things uh, today. So this is part of the separate session that uh, we are working on uh, internally as well, and uh, we'll be happy to present it at one of the one of the seminars uh, to 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 FCDO and Data Science Hub as well. Are are there any logistic questions before that? And as previously, feel free to put your questions in the chat. I will be going through the chat uh, uh, while I'm I'm going through the tutorial as well. In addition to that, I have my colleagues from 3IE who are moderating the chat as well. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat right there and um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go through them. One last thing is that we will be using Python programming language for this tutorial. Many of you may not have worked with Python earlier. You may have experience using R, which is fine. You could follow uh, along. However, those who may have experience uh, using Python language would find it relatively easier to follow what's what's being done, although others can 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 do that as well. All right, then any any questions up until this time? Perfect, then I'll be, uh, I'll proceed. So there, there are two things that we are using over here. First is uh, Python programming language, and the second is Google Earth Engine. Now there are two reasons. Uh, there are reasons why we are going with that way. First is that uh, because it's an introductory tutorial, Google Earth Engine is the easiest medium we found because Google Earth Engine, Google Collab, and Python they all could link in just one package, so that people do not have to install. Anything because installing many software can also act as a deterrent of not uh, proceeding further for, for, for those tasks as well. That's why we decided to, to use Google Collab so that you do not have to install anything. Second is uh, Google Earth Engine. It uses cloud computing, which allows you to perform quick calculations in a relatively short amount of time. So that's possible. That's why we use Google Earth Engine. And Python is the easy to follow language, which is generally said that it's easier for beginners to pick up. That's why we use Python. And also as a, as a next follow up of this tutorial, we wanted this to be included in the machine learning aspects as well. And Python is a language which is champion in the current paradigm of things for machine learning and deep learning as well. So that's why we focus on Python and Google Earth Engine. So the way you run the if if you could show me by a raise of hand, like everybody could raise their hand, those who have the Google Earth Engine uh, account right now who are looking at this tutorial. Okay, so that's more or less nine people. Well, the eleven. Okay, that's that's a great that's that's a great number. All right. Thank you. You could lower your hands. So the way we run Google Earth Engine is if you go through this, let's say there th this notebook is made up of two parts. One of which is the textual part and one of it is the coding part. So you could see the textual part. It's written in Markdown. It's one of the ways of writing things. And then you see these green uh, bars, the, the, the bars with green background. These are the actual codes which you could use to run. Is there any question by Natalie? OK, thank you. So yes, introduction to Google Earth Engine installation of packages. We need two packages for running Google Earth Engine. One of them is the uh, Earth Engine API, which is uh, Google's uh, Google Earth Engine's way of running the code in Python. 
And second is GMAP, which is a package which helps us to visualize and do some other calculations that are there. We install these commands using we, we install these packages. So in, in the Python programming language, we call these as libraries or packages, and we install them using the command pip install. So this is how we are going to do the first thing. You, you could see that uh, the content that is after the hash sign or the pound sign is the comments. These comments make it easier to read the codes. So if you could, uh, if, if you click on the codes like I did and you press shift plus enter, you'll be able to see some output. If your internet is fast enough, it will be quick. If it's not, it can take some time. So then you must click on restart runtime. So the way we, the reason why we click on restart runtime is so that uh, these new packages that have been installed just now can be used by the code, subsequent codes that are there. So if you click on restart runtime, then yes. So that is our first thing. You could see that over here it says initializing, which means that it's it, it's initializing a session for us. Similarly, as previously, we click on the command, then we press shift plus enter. So import command takes these packages in, inside our current working environment. So if, if it's, it's, it says over here, it took th three seconds to complete that. Now it could uh, be faster if, if you are on a faster internet connection. Mine is not so fast, so it, it takes me this amount of time. Now this comes uh, over here, very important step of authentication. Those who do not have Google Earth Engine account may not be able to proceed beyond this point, so those may just look at how, how we are approaching things and then they could do things on their own and if they have any questions, they can. So you click on this link. And it's the ID that I have from 3IE. I get this unique ID. I paste it here and then press enter. So it says successfully saved authorization token. So if you start this node, Book again, every time you start this notebook, you will have a new authorization token. Yes, Natalie. So, uh, like we are installing the, I mean, the first two command pip install and we obtain an error. Mm -hmm. Is it an error or it's a warning? We can, can we leave it and continue? Yes, yes, yes. It's a warning. You can ignore it and continue. Okay. <clears throat> Check. Then we initialize the session using ee.initialize. E Perfect. So we run the command. Up until this point, if somebody is not able to run the commands, they can stop me right now. After that, I'll take another break in some time. Just, just a pause. Okay. Questions? Which means I can proceed. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, where do we where do we put the authorization code in the notebook? I missed that bit. So once you run this command uh, command ee dot authenticate after pressing shift plus enter, you must have got a box, and you put that into that box and press enter. That's how you 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 do you do that. Great. So I will proceed further because there's a lot to cover, and I mean. Once more, I need to write, reiterate the fact that if you do not, if you are not able to run any command, you could always run this on your own as well, and you can always ask me questions later on too, if if not in this session. Uh, yes, Denise. Denise. Mm, yes, thank you. But here for authenticate, there is no inter the verification code. There is no verification code. Yeah, which which verification code should we enter? Uh, the one which the, the account with which uh, you used. Uh, we do not see the code. The code it comes from the account with which you have used to create an account with Google Earth Engine. Uh, 
Um, you, you. So if it's possible, you could both. Uh, OK, let me put in my email address in case you do not have. Please feel free to reach out to me on this after the session as well. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I have to rush through the things. It's not that uh, I did not want to entertain everything. Someone who did not manage to create account. They may only be able to follow what I'm doing. They, case, they can see what others are doing and they may not try it on their own because they do not have account on Google Earth Engine. So first they need to create an account and then only they can run the codes. But this process can take a day or two getting the account done. And once you have that, the notebook is shared with all of you. You could use that to to run through the codes and. Uh, yes, thank you Esther for mentioning that. OK, so we'll we'll proceed further and uh, we'll try to make first map using Google Earth Engine. So the way we do that is we find out the latitude and longitude of a place and we found out the zoom level for which we need the, the map visualized. And the way we find out latitude and longitude as well as zoom level is by going to Google Maps and then finding out it over there. So yeah, if I go to maps.google.com and let's say I'm interested in mm, Big Ban London. So I put it over there. Then these are the relative coordinates that Google uses for for its work. So you could say this is how I could refer to them and 17 is the zoom level. So the zoom level can change depending upon the, the person who is using the screen. Those who may have a larger monitor, they may need it smaller. Those who have a smaller screen may need it larger as well. Where are we going? A verification code. Yes, you do not get that from your email. You get that from Google Earth Engine directly. So this is how you could use use this um, to find the latitude and longitude. Now I click on that and I set it as variable. Central lat is this. Central long is this. Zoom level is twelve. And I use this to make the first map. Once again, Shift plus Enter. And now I need to visualize this. So right now we just created the map. We also need to visualize it. So I run this command and then I see. Map of Addis Ababa. So this covers the first part. It was it was a very simple thing and some people have asked me that what's the value that this brings? We could just go to Google Maps, take a screenshot and then we'll be fine. However, this is a step and there are subsequent steps which are built on this step. So it's it's an initial thing. Now, congratulations on the first map generation. At this point of time, you may either have got the map or not. If you do not have the map, the reason could be you do not have a Google Earth Engine account. You do not have the required packages. Yes, that's right, Esther. In, at several points in this notebook, you will see that I have put in some exercises for you to try out after the after the tutorial. So you could uh, you could do these tasks and uh, you could begin writing your code here. Let's say if you want to write something, my underscore map equals to G map. So then you could finish the whole command and then press shift press enter. It will do the same thing. This is done as a homework for you. So after after the session, you could go through these things and then do it. A little bit of theoretical part at this point of time. There are various ways for us to find uh, different sources of uh, satellite data that is available on Google Earth Engine. So if you could go to developers, uh, you could you could just go to Google Earth Engine catalog on Google. You click over here and then you see that a lot of data sets are there that you could use for your work. For instance, it could be related to surface temperature if your work demands that. It could be climate data sets as well atmospheric weather data sets. The imagery could be from Landsat. OK, thank you, Robbie. And then Sentinel data sets, modest data set as well. So you could you could use, let's see if I'm interested in Sentinel data sets. I can click on Sentinel and then I can see what kind of Sentinel data sets are available. For example, I have Sentinel to MSI, Sentinel and one SARGRD. Sentinel 5P is for pollution monitoring, so we are using Sentinel 2 for this tutorial. If I click on Sentinel 2 MSI, you see I have two. Then it's 
surface reflecting data set that I could use. So over here it shows me how I access how I can access that. So if I use ee dot image collection and then Copernicus forward slash s two underscore sr, this is how I could refer to this data set. This is also what's covered in the tutorial as well. Finding and importing satellite data on Google Earth Engine. The step one is you go to Google Earth Engine's catalog. Step two is you search for the imagery that you look out you want for your work. For instance, in this case, it was Sentinel. Then, then you could uh, click on the uh, ca catalog as well. So this is how this is was ee dot image collection that I referred to earlier as well. Next is clipping map to custom shape files. Let's say if you do an intervention in one of the provinces in one of the states of India, let's say if uh, if you are doing a, an intervention in the northern states of India, then you need to see the effect in the northern states. That's why we are not always interested in seeing the imagery for the whole world, but only for that part in which we are interested in. And there are two reasons for that. One is that because we want minimum usage of our computer processing. Otherwise, Google Earth Engine will think that you are using it for commercial purposes, which it does not allow uh, for, for the free account. Now they have started offering their commercial services as well, which are paid. So you need to have minimum allocation of the resources. And second thing is it's also faster because then you do not make the map of the whole world. So you could say uh, you could use the FAO's uh, global administrative unit layer as the data set for selecting provinces. For instance, I used uh, GOUL. Uh, I used GUL uh, data sets for selecting admin name. Let's say I was interested in Bihar. Bihar is one of the states of India. It's in Eastern India. So the way I selected is Bihar equals to states dot filter, then ee dot filter dot equal to. So I will try as much as possible to explain how the commands work. But we could, there could be many combinations as well that you could use. So ee.filter.eq takes admin one as the column and then looks for Bihar. And after that, it filters those just like we do it in Excel. And then it gives me a collection which says that, okay, all these cells that are there in this table uh, belong to Bihar, uh, Bihar. And then I can use that to clip image only for Bihar. There's one more way to do that, and it's by putting on assets in the in, in the code.earthengine.google.com. This is one way of approaching things. However, we do not use that, nor do we recommend it at this point of time because it uses JavaScript, which many in the developing uh, in, in the development sector are not very, very well aware. So it's, it's mostly R and Python that we have seen in our, our personal experience as well. So we recommend Pyth uh, going with the Py a Python way. The other important thing is that you may not always be interested in finding images for all period of time. You are only interested in some months or some years or some weeks. So the way you do it is you find out using dot filter date. This is the beginning. This is the end for which you need the data sets from. And then median. Oh, so this is uh, this is something that I would like to focus a little bit more uh, time on. I take I let's say there are in from the period A to period B, there are 15 images that have been captured by the satellite. And because my intention at this point of time is to get one single image that is representative of the entire thing. So I use the median image. So this this allows me to took a look at the complete picture using just single image. Median is one of the ways some people may are maybe interested in finding the maximum value of a pixel. Some may be interested in finding the minimum value of a pixel. Some may be interested in finding the average value of a pixel. So in my purposes, I was interested in the median value, but if your research question warrants you to look at maximum or minimum values, you could just change this command to max min or AVJ. Uh, also, one, one point, uh, one very important thing to mention at this point of time is that all the commands that are mentioned in this tutorial can be accessed from Google Earth Engine's API, in which you see all the examples and the way these commands work and explanations. It's an excellent guide prepared by Google that, that could be helpful as well. Day before yesterday, there was a question about cloud filters. So if an image is cloudy, what do we do? In that case, I only take images in which the percentage of pixels that are clouded by the, uh, that are that are considered as clouded by the machine um, just a second. So these can be, they, we can put a filter over there. It says ee.filter and then cloud pixel, pixel experience, uh, cloud pixel percentage 
could be 15%. So I'd only take those images for which the cloud uh, percentage is less than 15. Selecting bands from multispectral satellite images. So when these images are clicked, they are form of, of various bands. So it's uh, you could see in the image that there are one, two, three, four, five bands, and they are combined to make one single picture. If your research question wants you to look at only one band, then you could just take that band and use it for your analysis. However, if it requires you to look at two or three bands, as we'll see further in this tutorial, you just need to select those bands, perform the operation, and then you could you could look into that as well. Uh, Sentinel 2A has 13 bands, and we, we may not be interested in all of them. So if, if whatever bands we need, Google Earth Engine allows us to only look at those bands. If you would have gone the traditional way, we would have needed to download a lot of images, which is not always possible if you do not have a great internet bandwidth as well. So VIR's nighttime day night band composite version is one of the examples that I'll be using to run this code. Okay, so this is the nighttime vision of Earth as taken by the instruments that are aboard the day night band uh, satellite by VIIRS. I look at image collection. So this is the source of the satellite imagery. And then I filter it for the date 2020, 1st January to 2020, last December, 31st December. I select average radiance band, and then I compute the median value. So this is the main code. After that, I make a map. I add this on this map. I add the layer that is the layer that was created earlier. And then this add layer control commands help us to see all these buttons that you see on the left hand side to select regions or find some values as well. So this is how we do the plotting of a single band. You could see that a lot of places in Africa do not have a very huge intensity of lighting. However, if you compare it with uh, the Western Asia region, Europe, and then South Asia and Eastern China, that has a lot of lighting. This to the very north is an aberration because over here, these are the northern lights that are uh, that, that are there. So a lot of it's captured as lighting, although it's not lighting. So this is important to understand that it's very important to have a contextual understanding of the actual place for which you are doing the analysis as well. You could see that the north part of India is very densely lighted. It's because uh, there are a lot of people in this part of India and they all have access to electricity at the point at the point of time when this image was taken. You could see that in in Egypt, all pretty much pretty much all of the civilization is spread around the Nile River. So you can see a lot of growth and this Nile River Delta has the highest uh, highest amount of uh, people living over there. So you could see it also from the light intensity. The dark area over here is Sahara, and then this is the northern establishments that are there in Africa. So this is one of ways of re representing the day-night band data. In Europe, you could see where the highest, uh, high, high, highest amount of lighting is. It's in the Western Europe side of uh, Western Europe. Let's go further. So this is exercise that I have prepared for you. You need to do the same thing. You will be using Sentinel 5P data and then use it for visualizing nitrogen dioxide that is there in the atmosphere. It should it will give you us an idea of how polluted particular areas are. So sometimes it's not always possible to find out the weather stations in all part of the country. While I was working in northern Himalayan regions of India, there weren't many set, uh, many stations that were measuring air pollution in in those regions. But uh, with the help of these satellite images, we could have an idea of how the pollution levels are varying over time on those regions. So Sentinel 5P allows you to do that. Any questions until now? I'm sorry for, for just rambling because this is more of a session that is interactive by people doing code on their own. And uh, some of you do not have an ID, no problem. Once again, please make the ID later on, run the code, run the notebook. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll be answering all your questions. Perfect, so I'll proceed. 
Now we come to module three, which is introduction to vegetation and water indices. There were several reasons why we decided to go with vegetation and water indices is that it's beginner friendly. We wanted the session to be more hands on for the people who wanted to try out things on their own. That's why we decided also a lot of research has been already done so people could see that how these indices can be calculated and how they can be used for, for, for their work. That's why we decided to focus on vegetation and water indices. Vegetation indices, we are using three. No, normalized difference vegetation index, green NDVI, and enhanced vegetation index. So I'll not in, I'll not go into the details of why one index is better than the other, or whether we need another index, or why is it there that we have three indices? When do we use which one? These things are covered in the text over here. If you could go through the text, you will find some of the answers. However, I have also linked extensively to all the studies that have used these indices to do those things. For instance, vegetation indices have been used to examine climate trends, estimate water content, monitor drought, schedule crop irrigation, crop management, and all these links point towards the studies which have used these things. So if you go there, you can find out the studies that have uh, that have used these things. Also, one of the good resource is index database. Index database lists out a lot of indices that are used to, let's say, show index for selected application. If I'm interested in crop yield, then what are the kind of indices that have been used? So some people have used normalized difference. Some people have used this. If I go over there, I can see how it has been used, what the kind of formula is for different source of satellite. For example, for Sentinel-2, Sentinel 2A, you see the formula is 8 minus 4 and 8 plus 4, which is a normalized difference between band 8 and band 4. So, so this is a very helpful resource for you to find out the remote sensing indices and how it could be used. All of this is covered in the tutorial. One personal preference that I have is to use functions while you are making code because these functions allow us to use that code for different purposes as well. And in a notebook, which you see right there on your screen, you could use you could create a function at one point of time and then it could be used at several places as well. So in this one, I create a function called def get NDVI. It takes in an image and then it returns a normalized difference of B8 and B4 band. Similarly, we create a map and then we put the center on center let center long zoom at the zoom level. The image is uh, made using the Copernicus S2SR and the filter date is 22, uh, 1st December 20, 1st January 2022, last uh, date of the year. And then I take the cloudy pixel percentage as 15 because I do not want this value to be calculated from those images that have a lot of cloud coverage. It, it may not always be very helpful for us. And once again, I focus on the median value. Others may be interested in max or min as well, like I have mentioned before. So NDVI params, this is a design element and some people may not like this color and also to find out what the min or max value could be, you could hit trial and error on the actual code to see how what kind of visualization work for you. There is this website called Color Brewer that helps you to find out color advice. It could be colorblind safe, print friendly, photocopy safe as well, and it will help you a number of classes that you have in your data and how what kind of colors you can use. So this is what you could use. Let me run this command and see what you get. Wait. So you see that the areas which are green are more dense in vegetation and the areas that you see in red have a lot of uh, urban area. You also see that these two areas of uh, red color, this over here, then another one over here and then over here. So these are water bodies because water bodies means no vegetation, like green vegetation. And these over uh, these areas over here point towards urban. Um, a question to you, can somebody guess what this area is? If you could see my cursor. You could either chat or unmute yourself and say. Maybe not someone who is from Addis Ababa. Lake, <laughs> OK, let me zoom in a little bit. 
to see if others can make a correct answer now. Perfect. Yes, it's an airport. Thank you, Robbie, for that. So you could see which colonies, uh, which which uh, areas in India we call a neighborhood as a colony. So which I, I was, I'm using that local word. So which colony has a lot of planning? Which colony is haphazard? You could see this from. Um, thank you, Chris, for the answer. Yes, that's true as well. So the dark areas is OK. The bonus question was where do you see the airport? And you have correctly identified that. So this is how we could use NDVI for our work for for Addis Ababa as well. You can create uh, uh, the exercise three asks you to create a map for Mombasa in Kenya. You could do that. Similarly, we can create green NDVI. So green NDVI uses band eight and band three to do the same task. This time I'll be using Maradi as uh, the region for the visualization. From this point onwards, you will see that uh, we are How did you know that it's an airport? How did I know it's an airport? Because uh, I checked it out on Google Maps as well, and then I saw that it's an airport. How did you know to take the difference between those two specific bands? Is that established practice, or did you have to test various options? Nope. Um, thanks for asking this question, Robbie. So I was because I was calculating NDVI, and NDVI only uses NIR and red bands. So NIR and red near infrared and R from the RGB. So if I'm using if I'm calculating NDVI, I only use NIR and red bands, none other band. That's why I use these two bands only. In in Sentinel's case, it's band eight and band four. I hope that answers your question. For green NDVI, we do the similar thing. You could see that the densest, greenest areas are in the southern part and the northern areas are relatively less green. Similarly, you had seen that uh, we, we created a function image dot normalized difference because normalized difference is a very common practice in 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 the whole satellite imagery analysis that Google Earth engine created a formula. You could just put in your bands and it finds out the value for you. However, for enhanced vegetation index, which has been postulated by Huita et al. in 2002, you see that this is a more complex formula. And we need to create a formula for uh, we need to create a formula for that particular thing in in, uh, in in Google Earth Engine. So the way we do it is I start I initialize with a map. I put in the center and the zoom level on the basis of my monitor's screen as well as what area I was interested in. And after that, I selected the state. I was interested in Donga, so I first created a variable called states, which included all the admin one states, and then I created uh, admin one filter, which only showed me the picture for Donga. Then I create EVI image. Similarly, I take the image collection, which is Copernicus S2 SR. I filter it for the dates 2020. I once again filter it for only those images which have a cloud coverage of less than 15%. I found out the median values and then I clip it to only Donga so that I do not get anything else. And then I create this expression. So EVI image dot expression is Google Earth Engine's way of creating, uh, of finding out a value. For instance, you could see that NIR is EVI image. EVI image is the image that we found out from the first, second, fourth, fourth line of code. And then we are selecting band eight. Then we have EVI image and then we select band four. Then we have EV, EVI image and we select band two because these are the three bands that are required for us to calculate EVI. After that, I write it that this expression needs to be evaluated, which is 2.5 into NIR minus red, the whole divided by NIR plus six times red minus 7.5 times blue plus one. The other commands are similar. So we do we do get a, a region. Um, a representation of enhanced vegetation index. The southern areas are more green as compared to the northern ones. This could this this could help us to answer some of the research question. Why is it that southern part is more green, or what kind of um, approach we should take if we need to have an intervention in the southern areas? Because those things can vary between the north and the south. 
In the same way, we also have water indices that could be used for these purposes. For instance, NDWI is one of the water indices that you could use for your work. This is normalized difference water index. For Merida, once again, the commands, we have a normalized difference function. Then we create a map by putting center as here. Then we found out the image collection, the filter date, and then the median. Um, at one point of time, some, some participants in the workshop today may find it difficult of all these terms that are being over, used over here. This could be, there could be two reasons for that. One is that uh, it's it's in Python. Second is it's Google Earth Engine's own uh, commands that are there used by Google Earth Engine. So it may take some time for you to pick up those exact commands and how you run them. So you see a, uh, you see an image of the of the NDWI. Modified NW, NDWI. So there's one important point over here is that uh, MNDWI we are using Landsat for making this not Sentinel because Sentinel would have asked us to do pen sharpening, which would have made this more complex. So we decided to not include pen sharpening in this and then use Landsat image. So the Landsat image can also be extracted in the same way. First, we define the function, then we create the coordinates of the map. After that, we found out the states. I was interested in Goa, the western state of India. And then I create an image collection from Landsat LC08. And for the dates that I was interested in, once again, uh, then one, one thing if uh, somebody has picked up, it says cloud cover. Whereas earlier for referring to cloud cover, I was using the command cloudy pixel percentage. Now, why are why is there a difference? Can anybody answer that question? Cloudy pixel percentage versus cloud cover. Why do I use two different terms for the same purpose? Should I wait? Should I tell the answer? <laughs> OK, I'll tell the answer then in that case. The reason is that in this case, we are using Landsat image, whereas earlier we were using Sentinel images. A quick suggestion on Landsat versus Sentinel is that Landsat offers images from quite a long bank period of time. For instance, if you are interested in the impact of a particular intervention that was done, let's say, in 90s or 2000s, then you could look at the Landsat images. However, if you need high resolution images, they are available from Sentinel, but only for the relative period of time. I think it's after 2013, maybe that they are offering uh, those images as well. So what you are interested in, what's your research question, what kind of resolution you need, these are the questions you should be asking before you decide whether to go with the Landsat or the, or the Sentinel images. Right, let me draw MNDWY map for you and see what we get. These are the water regions that, that are visualized over here. Because we are using shapefile of Goa and many of the shapefiles do not include the sea area, we do not see it very clearly. The alternative is to not use uh, clipping and just define the geometry which is covered at one of the sections in this notebook. You could go over there as well. Okay, now I come to the last part, which is exporting these indices as covariates. So visualizing all these things is good as one of the assessment to find out what's happening on the ground. But let's say if you want to see whether there is a geographical dependence on your outcome on your outcome variable, then you are also interested in getting this as one of the covariates in your model. So the reason uh, the, the way we do that is we export these tables and then the column that as the value, the geographical value or the indices value that you're interested in, you could take it as one of the independent variables or covariates in your work. At this point, it's also worth mentioning that uh, this CSV file, which is saved, is saved in the Google Drive of that account, which is used to make Google Earth Engine account. It's not saved anywhere else. You cannot download it directly to your local computer. You save it to that account's drive, then you go to drive.google.com, download it, and then you see the value. However, it's not uh, CSV is not an option. You can also have shapefiles, GeoJSON files, KML, KMZ, 
or PF record using export.table, the, the command that you have. In this code, I export values for Bihar, uh, the state in the eastern part of India, and hopefully I shall have that. Sorry. says export table example that should be the name of the file that is created over here. So you will see that you see export table example has been created. Now if you go to this file, there will be many columns that you see over here and it's a disadvantage of Google Earth Engine that it doesn't give you a dictionary code book of what those values mean. However, the hint over here is that you have all these very uh, all these columns from column A till column M as part of the original shape file which you use to find out these geographies. For example, I was interested in Bihar and I was using FAO's GAUL layer. That's why these are the values that have, uh, have come from there. And then median column number N is the actual value which I calculated using the formula that I have. So now I could take these values and put it as uh, in, in, in the places which uh, were interested. For instance, column number G, list out the name of those districts, Bhagalpur, Munge, Rotas, Saharsa, Sitamari, Panka, Papua, etc. So for these districts, the value of vegetation is 0 0.357, 0 0.347, 0 0.310. There's also a way of exporting the image. Let's say if I create this image, I can export this image as an image, and then I can take it into a software, let's say ArcGIS or QGIS, and then use it for further analysis. Um, personally speaking, I like uh, uh, the approach of taking the status uh, of uh, geographical uh, analysis software because it offers a lot of functionalities that Google Earth Engine does not have till now. But Google Earth Engine is a cloud environment, so you can work with your team on this. However, QGIS, as far as my knowledge goes, doesn't allow you to work simultaneously by many people in the cloud environment as of now. Maybe it could change uh, in, in the future as well. So there I will end the session over here. There are some examples and a case study which I told I will be covering, but due to the paucity of the time will not be able to cover. There is a one example that I could run before you. It shows how the tra how the landscape of India changes from pre monsoon to post monsoon and then try to visualize it. Using a sliding bar. You see that initially it's all dry because in the in the in the summer months there is no rain, pretty much no rain. However, after the monsoon season, you could see that all these tiny lakes are all filled up with water. So there's a lot of water in these areas as well as the landscape changes. Now the thing that one needs to keep in mind is that some of it is also agricultural crops because a lot of crops is dependent upon the irrigation from the rains in the western part of India. So you see it a lot of greenery. This does not mean that suddenly there's a forest cover that has increased. It just means that the crops that are there right now are pretty lush and green after the monsoon rains. That's why I'm sorry. Focusing on the local context is very important before you make judgment just on the basis of the image. And you could see over here how the landscape has transformed itself. The water body size has also increased. You could see that before monsoon, the water body is a smaller, but after the monsoon, the size has increased. I would request you to do the number four hands on demo on your own and share with me the results you get because we could use this to 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 to, to do to replicate the case study that was done by 3IE. It's an excellent case study that tried to find out the enhanced vegetation index around the areas where mine was located and how it changed after the enactment of environmental impact assessment law in India. So you could see that as a, as, as a case study to do on your own. At the end, I have shared additional resources that you could use to further explore these topics. These are some good websites that would help you to look into those things. And finally, the statement of contribution. So I was I made this tutorial along with my colleagues Douglas Glandin, Shane Hamaker, and Shai Khatua, who involved quite heavily on this and get, got involved on, on, on a lot of uh, on a lot of work uh, collectively. So I end it here. Thank you so much for your time and your attention in, in, in this workshop, and I will now request 
Tim or Esther to uh, to come for, for, for the closing remarks. I'm sure that it was a very fast session, but somehow in an hour it's it's sometimes very difficult to individually uh, chat with every person.